Good afternoon, and again, I greet you in peace. And to my Muslim brothers and sisters, I say assalamu alaikum. It's certainly a, an honor, a pleasure to be here to be a part of the discourse and actually to pay tribute and recognize the work of Dr. Hudson and uh, Ms. Harvey and the Progressive Group and all of those who've made the sacrifice. We, one can only imagine the efforts and the struggles that were necessary to bring us thus far. And so I speak this afternoon from the Islamic perspective, not just from the position of resistance, but more so from a position of persistence. From the standpoint that the latter speaks more to continuously moving forward with your objective in mind. So let's proceed forward. I'll share a bit about the birth of the Nation of Islam and its mission the Islamic faith and its fortitude, and it combating racism. Perhaps two examples of Clara Muhammad's school and the Muhammad speaks, and then where we are today with respect to the Islamic community. It is, a, it is without doubt, without question, that racism is the foundation in Bermuda society. In the creation of race construction, it occurred in two phases. From the beginning of time or the early settlers up to 1970, and then the 1970s and 80s. And perhaps we can argue today that the third phase has just occurred when you talk about international business and the lack of diversity in males, et cetera, in the particular institution or that industry. But even before we get there, let's just make the point that racism, as our dearly beloved scholar, Dr. Swan points out, was actually built into colonialism. And in the case of colonialism, I think it's important for us, get these notes sorted out, to remember that Bermuda's still a colony. And as much as we enjoyed these privileges, there's more work to be done with disrespect. Why? Because colonialism is a system whereby the colonizer, colonizers rule through policies used for the purpose of controlling for independence. It's also a system which perpetuates policies of exploitation where the colonizers have the monopoly over the economy. Moving forward, colonialism also brings forward the idea of inferiority in a society. And so it is against this backdrop that the Nation of Islam, via the Muhammad Speaks newspaper, arrives in Bermuda. I must point out as well that this time, this 1960s and 70s era, is a time when other organizations, such as the Bermuda Industrial Union, which is already established, the Progressive Labor Party, and of course, as we heard earlier, from the Black Beret Cadre, uh, were formed, very active in the society. The organization itself, the Nation of Islam, as we well know, was created by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who was influenced by Marcus Garvey. And so Garvey's philosophy was self-determination to do for self. Elijah Muhammad believed that it was important for African Americans who were being oppressed uh, to institute, to create a system that would combat the racial oppression and injustice in the society. So that transformed and arrives here in Bermuda in the 1960s. In so doing, gentlemen such as Kenneth Castle, Dilton Matthews, Askia Muhammad, pick up the paper and have the desire to disseminate it nationally. We know that much risk was in involved in this dissemination because the paper was banned in 1963. And it was banned under this premise, which was put forward by Lord Modmere, that the doctrine of black supremacy and non-corporation of whites could affect the less colored Bermudians. 
okay, the doctrine of black supremacy and non-cooperation of the white community could affect the last colored Bermudians. That's where we are. That's where it was. Already? <laughs> In so doing, the members of the Nation of Islam saw fit to persist, selling a total of 12,000 papers. In any event, 1974 marks the highlight, the peak of the Nation of Islam, in that the organization is able to formulate its beliefs, its value system, um, establish businesses, increase its membership. I believe they were in excess of over 300 members. Uh, and they become uh, 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 um, a mainstay in the community, so to speak. But 1975 is very significant because it brings about the passing of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And in so doing, his son, Imam Warathi Muhammad, assumes the leadership of the Nation of Islam. Imam Muhammad, bless his soul, created one man, brought about a transformation of black Muslims and converted over one million African Americans and by extension Bermudians into Orthodox Islam. Dr. Suleiman Yang identifies it as an, a bloodless revolution where one million African Americans saw fit to make the transformation from the Nation of Islam to Orthodox Islam. Okay, and I point out there, the point, the idea of Orthodox Islam being that there's one God, prayer, fasting, uh, charity, and a visit to Mecca. Now, in that transformation, he also changes the name of the Muhammad Speaks newspaper to Bilal and Luz. So the fact that even though the, pa the paper was banned, it never became an issue no longer because the name was changed. <laughs> Moving forward, perhaps the, the largest obstacle, the biggest obstacle was with respect to the Muslims opening an elementary school. And what I've pointed out here is the timeline and the articles that were back and forth throughout the country in this effort, a total of 15 years for this religious community to open up a school. And, let me make the point, and by 1990, when the time had come, there was still no government approval. So, were they resistant or were they persistent? In addition to the opening of the school, Imam Muhammad also had recommended that the Muslim community become engaged in the broader community, that it, it open its doors uh, to other ethnicities and other communities, because the philosophy prior to that was one of, quote unquote, uh, separation. The Nation of Islam did not want to integrate with, with the main society. Perhaps one of the most significant points that he stressed to the community was the idea of impressing upon them and the believers the removal of racial images in religious institutions and in the homes because of the negative impact it had on individuals. You know, you're familiar with the Canna Cloth study with respect to the dolls, uh, where little children were given a black doll and a white doll. Well, interestingly enough, that effect still takes place today. Why? In 2018, we still see African-American women bleaching themselves, bleaching their skin wanting to be of a lighter complexion. So, let's push this forward. I have a minute, they say. What's happening in the transformation, since the transformation? Well, since 2016, 2014, the local community has seen fit to host a, a number of international conferences where 150 to 200 Muslims have seen fit to visit the shores and integrate with Bermudians. We've seen the submission of the uh, the uh, Masjid Muhammad submissions to the Independence Commission. Now, this is very significant. Why? Because I told you earlier about the purpose of colonialism and what it is in the Muslim's position with this. Then and now, it's important for us to determine our destiny as a people. In 2012, there was the appointment of the first Muslim senator, Brother Cromwell Shakir, and then recently in 2018, they have the highest ranking uh, female officer, Muslim Naima Aswad. What else is happening? Well, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, Muslims take the time to feed the homeless. Um, they reach out in a faith dialogue, visit the prisons, etc. There's much to be done. There's a hospital that needs to be built. 
a cultural center that needs to be established. And so the challenge for the next generation or the present generation is to embrace modernity with patience and perseverance, but more importantly, believe and know that their responsibility is to follow through from the work that has been done from our pioneers. I leave you with Franz Fanon's quote, every generation out of relative obscurity must explore its mission or purpose. Fulfill it, you got it. Thank you.